Well, good morning, and thanks for uh, coming to the, to the London Room. You're really in for a treat. We've got Dr. Azaraza, who uh, many of you heard speak the other day, um, because I know a lot of people came up and told me how moved they were by her presentation and her words. And she's, um, for those of you who didn't, she's a professor of medicine at Columbia University. She's also the clinical director of the MDS Institute, and she's the executive director of the First Cell Coalition of Cancer Survivors. And, doc <laughs> and a poet. And Dr. Eric Topol is here, and he's followed a path through uh, um, interventional cardiology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and his path has taken him through UCSF and Johns Hopkins and the Cleveland Clinic and University of Michigan, not in that order, and now he is at Scripps Research. Uh, and he has been cited as the most influential physician executive in the country. And both, both of these are very forward thinkers and they have uh, also are educators. Um, Dr. Raza obviously has published a book that got her here, and Dr. Topol is no stranger to this conference. He's been here before. He has three books. And they both not only have published widely in the medical field, but they also keep us updated regularly. Doc, Dr. Raza is a, a blogger and contributor to 3 You can probably find that in your program if you're interested. And if you're interested in staying abreast of medical things, and if Elon Musk hasn't canceled your Twitter account, <laughs> and you had only one to follow, you would want to follow Dr. Eric Topol. Um, and I'm not the only one who feels that way. Oh, so, uh, and a little side note, I have to say, Dr. Topol, and I, this is not our first time having an interview. And he didn't remember, but in 1989, I was a junior resident at Mass General and looking to train in cardiology, and I traveled out to University of Michigan where Dr. Topol interviewed me. But this time, I get to ask the <laughs> questions, right? <laughs> so, um, I wanted to start by, uh, before we start talking about the future of medicine, just to s kind of lay the, um, the thought process, you know, I wanted to ask you both for, if you were to have a mission statement for medicine, what would it be? Dr. Azar, would, Azar, would you like to start us off? Mine is... Prevention is the best cure. Well, she came with that quick, Eric. Yeah, I hope you yeah. got something. <laughs> well, I, I second that, but I guess the thing that I see as the biggest void is restoring the care in, in medicine, the, the humanistic uh, element that we've lost and degraded over decades, and that's what I am working on the most. I mean. Yeah. Well, that's great. I think for, yeah, I was keeping it short, and I was, for me, it's just to ease suffering mm -hmm. is um, medicine. Um, well, I think we're going to get right to it. And uh, you know, the topic's the future of medicine. So I'm going to toss it right out and say, Azra, what is the future of medicine? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Koi. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers of this wonderful festival, especially Jamie Cab sitting here. Thank you so much. Uh, we've had the most fantastic three days here, thanks to you. Um, and just a warning, what do you call two cardiologists <laughs> oh. trying to make, trying to see what an oncologist is saying? A double blind study. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that really hurts. <laughs> Meant to. <laughs> it's interesting to give me a couple of minutes to make my statement about what should be the future of medicine or what, in my opinion, is going to be. The great anthrop anthropologist Margaret Mead was once asked by her student, what is the first sign of civilization you saw in a culture? And what he was expecting was she'd say something like clay pots or grinding stone or something like that. But she said, a broken femur that has healed. 
Because she said, look, in the animal kingdom, if an animal breaks a bone like that, it is dead. Because it cannot walk to get water, it cannot uh, hunt to get food for itself. And most importantly, it's prey to all the other wild animals. So the fact that a femur, such an important bone, was broken and healed meant that somebody brought water, brought food, protected this person, took care of this person. And that is the first sign of civilization. So the metric for me for improvement in the future of cancer is to show more empathy mm. and to try and achieve cures and treatments which are not toxic, which are not worse than the disease itself. And prevention in that sense to me is the best way to approach the future of medicine. Sure, we are curing a lot of illnesses today, but with painful therapies, not just cancer. We need to get rid of all of them. So how do we do that? Well, in the future, we should be able to find disease-caused perturb disease perturbations easily in all sorts of compartments in the body, build huge big data sets which sit in eye clouds on every individual which are constantly being monitored by whatever AI that uh, Dr. Eric Topol is going to talk about. But the point is, in the future, we need to treat the human body as a machine which is monitored 24-7 for thousands and thousands of data points constantly being analyzed and constantly with the first sign of trouble try to prevent that to me is the real future of medicine um, Eric okay well Thank uh, you. Uh, yeah I would also echo the point about Jamie and the great organization here it's really extraordinary I've been to a few different writers festivals but this one is really amazingly well organized and smooth and Let me real take, pleasure. Take a minute there and I, I should have mentioned at the beginning that we, we wanted to have Dr. Sid Mukherjee up here with us as well and, and I know some of you, many of you are disappointed he's not here. He had his wife's birthday is tomorrow and and he is the re total renaissance man not only a scientist and a author and a writer but also a husband and so that's why he had to leave. Sorry. Okay. So um, I think one thing to get clear is that uh, this is the most exciting future of medicine that we've ever gotten to see, having been a student of it for nearly four decades. And cancer is one of the areas. Uh, we're not blind to that. It's actually really exciting because the ability to make a, a diagnosis of cancer through a, a simple blood test before it's ever shown up uh, on a scan is uh, an imminent potential. But um, as Alfred said, the thing that I'm into especially is the use of AI because right now we have over 20 million serious medical diagnostic errors a year in the United States. Over 20 million. And the National Academy of Medicine has put out their findings that each one of us will have at least one serious error that we'll experience in our lifetime if not more than one. And so the accuracy in medicine is really poor, and this is where leaning on machines can make a big difference. But that's starting to happen now. That is the ability for training um, uh, machines, in these so-called deep neural networks, to make whatever scan it is, whether it's an X-ray or um, an MRI, to have far more accurate diagnoses of those with the physician in the loop to oversee it. That's starting now, but where this is all headed, you've had to hear a lot about chat GPT in recent weeks and these so-called large language models. So there was this phase of deep learning, deep neural networks that basically was a renaissance of AI. But what's happening right now is this so-called large language models like foundation models like ChatGPT 
there will be more, there already are many besides that one, that handle over a trillion parameters uh, and are unprecedented with respect to the computing needs that are used, utilized, which explains in part why OpenAI uh, and Microsoft have come together, because they need Microsoft's vast computing power. But as we get more facile with these language models, you'll see the doctor. When you go to the appointment and they're sitting at their keyboard, no, they'll be liberated from their keyboard, liberated because the voice makes far better notes than the doctor does when they type all this stuff. And you also will see the ability, as Azra's pointed out, with all your data, wherever you've been in your life, different portals of your healthcare, pull together so that a lot of your history won't be missed, which also is important for accuracy. And then you know, the whole idea is that it's not just on the doctor-clinician side, it's also on the patient side. Mm -hmm. Because it turns out that we, many of us would like our data, capture our data through sensors and, you know, all sorts of things that are extraordinary right now. The ability, for example, to use a smartphone to use an ultrasound any part of your body and have that AI tell you how to do it. Like for me, as a cardiologist, I want to image the heart, do an echocardiogram. All, I, all a person would need to do is know that the heart is on the left side of the chest. <laughs> Usually, there's a rare condition when it isn't. <laughs> and then the AI will tell it how you move the probe up or down, counterclockwise, clockwise, and it will automatically capture beautiful video loops, which then will be automatically processed. And that's the same for any part of the body except the brain. So the things that a, a patient can do are going to be unprecedented. And that's going to empower patients, those who want to take advantage of this. And that also decompresses doctors and clinicians. And the bottom line is the gift of time. Because and you liberate from keyboards, you have all the data teed up, you give patients more empowerment. You now have time to sit down with patients and listen to them and do a good physical exam and care for them, which is what we have to get back, which we, we've lost for, for decades. Yeah. I think the, some of the challenges are that oftentimes the doctors who do inter engage with a computer during the visit aren't just inputting data, but they're trying to access labs and x-rays and, you know. And, um, Azra, do you have a computer screen that you use when you're seeing patients? <laughs> do you? Yes. <laughs> I don't take it with me. Yeah. I, um, I have a few patients in here. Fortunately, none of my 28 million mistakes are here today. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But I, you know, you'll know I, I really tried not to use that computer screen in the room when I'm with you. But, uh, but it is a challenge because I have to like, try to memorize all this stuff before I go in the room. Um, is there going to be a way to try to give people information in the room without having to access a screen? Or is the screen just something we're going to have to live with regardless? Well, I mean, the screen it can be useful when you want to show yeah. patients, uh, the images that they haven't seen or explain things. But outside of that, I don't know that it will be necessary to use them in the future. And that's going to be, the electronic health record was one of the greatest disruptive, destructive yeah. forces in medicine. And to get rid of that issue and making d uh, doctors as data clerks, right. where the disenchantment, depression, disillusionment has been profound. It's really for billing purposes more than Yes. Yeah. Uh, Azri, how do we get to where you're the, what you laid out, you know, um, how do we get there? Are we, yes. are we on our way? <laughs> That's a good question. Somebody asked uh, <laughs> Oscar Wilde, how did you lose all your money? How did you get there? You know mm -hmm. what he said? Gradually, gradually, then all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Listen, I've been working to get to this place for practically 40 years, gradually, gradually, but I think I'm at the point where I'm ready for all of a sudden. But how to get there? I can only talk about oncology. I'm so glad Eric is here to talk about the rest of medicine, but I can talk about oncology. One of the very sobering things, by the way, is that whenever I'm speaking to any audience, whether it's a room of 10 people or a room of hundreds like here, there are cancer survivors. There are people here who have active cancer. There are people here who are one degree separated from someone who has cancer. 
one of my uh, uh, qualifications to be sitting here today and speaking is that I'm an oncologist who sees 30 to 40 cancer patients a week. I have a research lab, but more importantly, I am a cancer widow. I lost my own husband who was head of a cancer center to the very cancer he had devoted his life to cure. So I want to first of all say, don't get scared cancer patients or anyone related to cancer in any way. I'm not going to say bad things. I'm going to end up saying very encouraging and optimistic <laughs> things. So please don't be scared. Just hear me out. The problem right now, before I get to how are we going to get to where we should be, the problem right now as I see it is the following. Two-thirds of cancer patients diagnosed in America today are cured. That's great. Indeed, it is something to celebrate. Two-thirds are cured. One-third who are not cured, their outcome is no different today in 2023 than it was in 1930. My problem is the two-thirds that we are curing, what are we curing them with? Surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy, by and large. There's a very few, thou few thousand patients who are given something mm -hmm. else. And the one-third that are not cured, we keep concentrating on that group, trying to chase down the last cancer cell and kill it. It has not happened. Um, in some, but there are some cancers where we have had. Yes, of course. Melanoma, maybe maybe myeloma. Yes. So very uh, few. Mm -hmm, very few. Um, I don't want people to get go out of this room thinking that there is no progress in cancer treatment. Of course, there's progress, but it is not just incremental; it is glacial. It's too slow. We need to accelerate that progress. So how do we do it? Well, first of all, treating all cancers like one is, is treating Africa as one country. Mm -hmm. So you have to personalize. You have to use precision medicine. There's no question about that. But equally importantly, I think, is the fact that we need to develop therapies for people who have cancer today, and half the resources should definitely go towards de developing more targeted, more precise, more less toxic therapies for advanced cancers. But the other half should be dedicated to the future where we are trying to diagnose cancer early. And by early, I don't mean stage one. I mean at the first cell level when cancer begins at that level, we need to detect it there and eliminate it so that it does not evolve into the end stage monstrosity that we cannot keep up with. So how do we find that first cell? Well, to begin with, the first cell doesn't arise out of nowhere. There's some stress. And I don't mean mental stress or physical stress. I mean stress inside an organ. Let's say in the liver, there is an infection, hepatitis B virus infection. Lots of cells in the liver are dying. They are getting the signal, fight or flight. Either you develop a strategy to survive or you're going to die. One of the strategies they develop, they end up developing occasionally, rarely, is that they survive not just short term, but forever. And that a normal response, gone awry, become exaggerated, results in a horrendous disease. But if we could detect those perturbations, if we could detect those stress markers just from blood, saliva, urine, feces, hair, nails, any of these things, detect the stress markers that are causing the appearance of the first cell, detect that. How we, we can get there. The whole roadmap is right there. It's the will. And please, nobody should think it's just the money. There's plenty of money in cancer research. It's just not being spent the way it should mm -hmm. be spent. Mm -hmm. It's being spent constantly on redundant things. 4,000 clinical trials going on right now, testing drugs that affect check 
checkpoints, checkpoint inhibitors. Why do we need 4,000 <laughs> clinical trials when each of them is costing hundreds of millions of dollars? This is how we are wasting our resources. So there's plenty of resources. We just have to spend them appropriately. I, uh, you know, when you said that we need a more personalized approach, we should not treat all cancers as one. It really, it, it, it remind me of a diagram in your book where you have the different layers of knowing a person, of, the, of starting with a genome and going through the transcriptome. And, uh, and that's a, a place where I think AI and, and that you address in deep medicine is really, uh, maybe you can speak to that. A yeah, bit. I mean, I, this actually folds in well with, I think, mm -hmm. a point that Ezra can comment on, but um, the sequence, the whole genome sequence is getting down to $200, even $100. So cost will no longer be the obstacle. But the question is, so we know most of the cancer predisposition genes, but we, you know, we don't use that data. And so the half of us that are destined to have cancer, at least one cancer in, in our lifetime, we, we're not given any forewarning about that our, our genetic deck that we were born with is gonna put us at higher risk and even particularly certain types of cancer to be on the lookout. And these companies like Grail and the others that are doing uh, a tube of blood, two tubes of blood to screen for cancer in healthy people, they are not using that data about whole genome sequence and cancer predisposition genes, which is stupid. And so I, I agree, the unintelligence of the clinical trials and this kind of brownie in motion and throwing all the stuff. And I, I don't understand why we still are relying on things like radiation therapy and toxic chemotherapy agents and also the fact that we use all these drugs that cost, you know, it's $100,000 minimum for a cancer drug, right? It's like when you call in the person, the plumber to your house, it's $1,000 just to walk in the door. It's $100,000 for any, and what do they do? They give, what, eight months, six months, Median, 10 months? No, uh, this is a good time for me to answer yeah. this right now. <laughs> so first of all, today, 70% of all drugs approved for cancer between 2006 and 2017 70% of all drugs improved survival by 0 0.00 months, yeah, not a day. Yeah, yeah. The 30% that improved survival, these are approved drugs, 30% that improved survival, it was by a median of 2.1 month. Right. That is the real date. I cannot make up these statistics. Yeah. They are so awful, yet, when you read all these headlines, <laughs> new cure found for pancreatic cancer, read the fine print because it will say in mice. <laughs> you, you made the point, we're really good at treating mice now. Huh? I am very, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I've never done that, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> er Eric, to your yeah. point, you're, like Angelina Jolie is a famous example of, of identifying a mutation. Right. And, that, and, and, and that's acting the, on that preemptive. Yeah, the, the BRCA mutation is, yeah. is the exemplar of that. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's common there's mutations. Others. You know, yeah. BRCA is rare, but there's a lot of common variants that uh, collectively account for someone's risk of cancer, even, d even before the age of 50, no less certainly yeah. as we get older. But the point is we have all this data that sit in wonderful peer-reviewed peer journals like Nature and Science and Cell about the genome, about all the different layers of data, whether it's the mi gut microbiome, which is really important, or whether it's the physiome through sensors and, and all these layers of data. And we don't put it into the clinic, the clinic. And this is something, of course, part of the problem has been dealing with massive data, as we already mentioned this, about you know, so much data per each individual. But we're finally gonna get to a point when we can do that and ultimately this virtual health coach, which is my dream that we finally fulfill prevention, yeah. where all your data is constantly being reassessed and fed back to you, not just about one thing, but holistically, and the medical literature that's pertinent to you as, as a unique individual, which each of us are. And that will help uh, fulfill the dream of prevention, because right now we don't ha really have any prevention. 
Yeah. We have secondary prevention, like you've already had a heart attack, we try to prevent you having another one. But we don't have any real primary prevention, that you never get that cancer, or you never have the asthma attack that you were destined to, that sort of thing. That's what we need to get to, and we will. It will take a number of years, but we're just starting to get to that point. By the way, I remembered something. You asked me about uh, the state of medicine, chemotherapy, why are we still using it? Oliver Wendell Holmes, I'm sure everyone knows who he was, said once that if we took the materia medica, everything we know about medicines, the whole compendium, and sank it into the ocean, no patient would be any the worse for it. The fish would be. <laughs> <laughs> so but he didn't say that recently. <laughs> <laughs> For most of chemotherapy, radiation therapy, that applies. Sorry to okay. interject, but go ahead. <laughs> but, you know, to your point about, you mentioned the microbiome, and just to, you know, expand on that a little bit, you, you talk about um, some research that's coming out of an institute in Israel. Uh, you know, I give my patients who are concerned about their hemoglobin A1C the same advice for all of them, and it's kind of dumb, right? I mean, they because I tell everybody the same rules because that's the best I know. And, and you were, uh, did this uh, thing for yourself where you had a, a continuous CGM monitor and they analyzed your microbiome and they came up with a list that you, I don't know, it's, I don't know if you stick to it or not. But maybe yeah, you no, it's, that it's, it's kind of a front runner where this is headed. But the idea is if all of us ate the exact same thing for breakfast, the exact same amount, the exact same time, our glucose in our blood after that would be completely scattered. Some of us, an accurate measurement, some of it would never budge, and some would go to 200 or 250. And the gut microbiome is part of the reason, and then there's, there's many, many different aspects of our individual um, physiology that accounts for this. And so people don't know that yet, and it turns out certain foods people have this reactive. So, you know, the same person that has a flat glucose response to one food might, for another, have something that's um, quite abnormal. It turns out a third to half of people have really big glucose spikes, which may be a risk for cancer. We don't even know. Mm -hmm. um, and we can avoid them if we teach people b through a glucose uh, monitor and getting these other layers of data, but we're, it's still in the early stages. Right. The point being is that there's all this data that can be collected now that we're not collecting or analyzing, getting back to people, which ultimately will help improve health. We, we're just starting to, to touch on this right now. We're, we're getting, you know, it's, uh, you talk a lot about using um, computer algorithms to help clinicians with pattern recognition and think you know, it, cardiology, computers have been reading EKGs for us for a long time. Um, and, and I think we're, there's a lot of interest in helping radiologists, helping dermatologists, uh, helping ophthalmologists with different uh, patterns. That's uh, one really important one that I just want to mention, the retina. Mm -hmm. So the retina, turns out it's a gateway to the whole body, yeah. that you can get a picture of the retina by the way, this is just a point, a note about AI. If we show the retina picture to the world's authorities on the retina and ask, is this from a man or a woman, the chance of them getting that right is 50%. <laughs> now, the AI gets it right 98% of the time, really? trained by uh, hundreds of thousands of images. But I can and get at it better than that, yeah, too. There are better ways to determine a person's <laughs> sex. There <laughs> really are. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the real interesting thing is, just picture this in the next few years. You'll take a picture of your retina with your smartphone, okay? It will tell you about your blood pressure control, your glucose control, your hepatobiliary tract, your kidney, uh, whether or not you have a risk for developing Alzheimer's, uh, wh what is your calcium score of your heart arteries, your risk for heart disease, and whether you have valve disease, I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. That's just the retina. That's just the things that machine eyes can see that humans can. Yeah. And that's what we're learning now in the past couple of years. It's extraordinary. And so training machines to see things that, pe that experts can't see, is ju we're just in the beginning of this, and it's, it's going to be a revolutionary aspect of medicine. 
th you know, the pattern recognition, that makes sense intuitively maybe to a lot of people here that a computer will be better. But what shocked me was the data about using AI to help psychiatry. Right, so there, the interesting thing is people would rather confide, confide in an avatar with all their deepest secrets <laughs> than talking to a human. No. Yeah, study after study document that. And so that, you can take a lot of advantage of that. All you yeah. need is some good avatars and you're starting to listen to and people about their mental health burden. But then also the, uh, the algorithm that's listening may be better at predicting who's likely to commit suicide. Right, right. Yeah, the risk of suicidal ideation and even frank suicide. We, their algorithms are being developed for that. Uh, there's been some, you know, uh, work in this. It's still not there, but hopefully it will. I think everybody here recognizes that mental health is uh, the greatest mismatch between health professionals and the burden. Uh, and this has to get fixed. And the only thing we have right now is, right, to, imminently is to, to leverage this opportunity. Yeah. I think one thing yeah. I'd like to add is that we talk about the illnesses that we have today. Uh, the first half of the last century, 1900 to 1950, really we saw tremendous changes in infectious disease. The next half we saw tremendous changes in heart diseases. I think the time for cancer and other chronic diseases has come in the first half of this century. And uh, all the things that we are individually working on will come together very suddenly, like I said, gradually, gradually, and it's going to happen suddenly. I'm a big reader of uh, Thomas Kuhn, big admirer of him, Structure of Scientific Revolution. He wrote this great book in the 60s, which I read every two years at least. <laughs> And one of the things he says is in the book, he says, you're not happy with the current paradigm of things. You want the paradigm to change. Show the success of the new one. That's what I believe in. Talk is cheap. We have to show success of what I'm talking about. If I'm saying early detection of cancer is good and not stage one early detection, first cell, well, if I'm actually able to find the first cell and show that by eliminating this cell, I am curing stage four cancers even because I've taken the original cell out, then the paradigm will shift overnight. It's like when the word processor came along, who cares about the typewriter anymore? You don't need to build a better ribbon for a typewriter and worry about it. You don't need a faster horseshoe because the car came along. So the same way, we need to bring this paradigm shift by showing success of what we are talking about now. And I think that that is the good news I want to give everybody here, that at least in cancer I can say the writing is on the wall. Eric didn't know that Siddhartha Mukherjee and I worked together, so maybe other people don't know. We actually have worked together very closely for 15 years. We share a lab. We are in the same program. Um, and uh, of course, uh, Siddharth says that I am a cross between his editor and his mother. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I can speak, <laughs> say a couple of things what he would, uh, uh, he said yesterday, which, uh, which is something about cell therapies. Yeah. And perhaps we can talk when we are talking about therapies, Please. we can, should I just say sure. a couple of words? Yeah, I th I th it's Look. really exciting, right? Not just for cancers, but other cells yeah. that, that behave badly, like yes. uh, autoimmune diseases, oh. lupus. Exactly. Yeah, please. Or Alzheimer's, all kinds of diseases yeah. that will be helped. So for last like 50 years, we have been concentrating on the genes being the culprit for everything. And we're trying, keep trying to fix the gene. Uh, we find a mutation in a gene in pancreatic cancer. We are going to find a magic bullet for that uh, particular mutation and cure. Well, for 50 years, we've tried in 200 cancers. It worked in one chronic myeloid. It hasn't worked in anything else, uh, practically nothing else. So we have to move beyond the gene. Siddharth's book, The Song of the Cell, is yes, it's the cell, the whole cell that's orchestrating things, not just the gene inside. Mm -hmm. 
So if we try to understand a cell and try to reverse everything in it, there are a trillion molecules inside a cell. It will take us thousands of years. We need a shortcut. The shortcut is we need to get rid of the cell, not try to target a gene inside the cell. How do we target a cell? With other cells. So cellular therapies are very important. And yeah. they've been around for a long time. The first cell therapy was given in 1900s when blood groups were identified and we started giving blood transfusions. Within 30 years, they were the most routine thing to give blood transfusions. Next came bone marrow transplants with stem cells. That's cell therapy. Yeah. Next came therapies for, uh, at NIH, Dr. Rosenberg saw that they were tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. He took out the lymphocytes, expanded them with IL-2, discovered by my good friend Bob Gallo, and expanded these till cells, gave them back to patients with cancer, and saw dramatic improvements. So those are cell therapies all along, but now the kind of cell therapies that we are coming up with in so many areas, in the last 10 years, it's like the floodgates have opened and there is this deluge of amazing information coming out. And it's very, very exciting because we are finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. To kill the real culprit, we have to target the cell. And to get there, we have to target it with other cells, with cell therapies. And that is my optimistic message to <laughs> all of you. <laughs> Hang in there. We are getting there with <laughs> cell therapies. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to uh, yeah. add to that. Uh, I think I, I just wrote a substack about this uh, last weekend, reviewing all the data, as you say, not just autoimmune diseases and cancer and even scarring, a scarring of the heart. It was a, a striking uh, report uh, from Johns Hopkins that you could reverse it with cell therapy. But the, it's not even just using the cells that we've had, like T cells. Yes. But the, the other biggest thing in medicine today is CRISPR yeah. and related types of genome editing. Okay, so Right now, this is being used to cure one shot. Things like sickle cell and thalassemia and um, uh, you know, clotting disorders and all that sort of thing. However, if you take out the cells from a person or even off-the-shelf cells and you edit those cells to what you want to do for that individual, whether it's a cancer or whether it's their type 1 diabetes or lupus or, or their scarring that's uh, of their liver or whatever organ, that gives us the opportunity to make those cells supercharged for that individual. And not only is it the power of genome editing, but now we even have synthetic biology gene circuitry that we can use. So what's happening right now is quite extraordinary. So I totally uh, concur yeah. with Asper. This is transformative. Okay. But the public doesn't have any clue about this. That is, CART therapy, CAR-T therapy, is available in many top medical centers today for specific, not just liquid cancers like leukemia uh, and the multiple myeloma, which used to be used bone marrow transplant, but also for beginning solid tumors that people die from, like pancreatic cancer or glioblastoma. And no one knows about this. So you, you don't know that, oh my gosh, I have this relative with a glioblastoma. Can I go to a place that has, uh, just using CAR-T therapy? And this is the sort of thing that is happening right now that you don't know about, which you're going to know a lot more about in the next couple of years, I think. Yeah. The, the CRISPR uh, is such a powerful tool, and it's really uh, a major revolution, and it's the ability to edit genes where you want it. And it's not only powerful in human cells, but I, I, um, when I was preparing for this, I called Josh Mesrick, Dr. Josh Mesrick, who may, may, maybe some of you remember was our transplant surgeon who came here three years ago. And, and I called Josh and said, hey, what's new? And you got to give me something good. And he said, uh, you know, um, still a lot of people dying with kidney disease, not enough kidneys going around uh, out there. And um, there is tremendous excitement about xenotransplantation, which is to take kidneys from animals, pigs, and use them as organs. But for uh, forever, we had problems because they would get rejected. But now we can use CRISPR to modify the pigs. So they can't reject. So they don't reject. And he anticipates that this will go into human trials as early possibly as next year. 
So you can just imagine now you could breed organs uh, and that, that will uh, transform the, the organs that we can't fix in our body. Mm. Well, maybe we can replace them with an organ that we've created in a different, different model. I want to yeah. add to that. Yeah. You, you know cut off my applause. By <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's old age, I do. <laughs> uh, look, I come from a third world country originally. I've been in America since 1977, but I come from Pakistan. And uh, in the beginning, when my parents were alive every year, sometimes twice a year, I would go back home. And whenever I went back to Karachi, my mother would have a list of patients that I would have to go and see with cancer <laughs> and yeah. you know, give them advice. And one time I landed, she said, uh, the driver who had come to pick me told me that you have to be taken just within hours to see this patient. And my mother said, this is a... 32-year-old, very poor, very unfortunate woman who was diagnosed with a blood cancer is dying. Go and see her and do what you can to help. When I arrived there to see her at this shanty little hut, there were three little girls sitting outside. So this is a 32-year-old patient inside with leukemia whose husband died in a car accident, has these three girls sitting outside. I mean, I go in, and before I go in, I meet the girls, and they look so pale and so horrible, uh, so skeletal. I said, are you okay? And one of them said, no. I don't know why we asked this question, um, the question my sister had asked, actually, which I remembered to ask. Have you had breakfast today? And the answer she gave is what I want everybody to remember what we are dealing with. This little girl, seven-year-old, have you had breakfast today? It wasn't my turn to have breakfast today. This is what we are talking about. We cannot develop only therapies that can apply to ivory towers in the developed world. We need to develop treatments that are universally and globally applicable for the benefit of all of society, all of humanity, not just remain restricted to few places. And of course, money, uh, the kind of costs will come down dramatically as they did for the genome sequencing from a billion dollars to a hundred, two hundred dollars today. But I think we need to remember that kind of, uh, of, of uh, uh, focus that we must have in mind always, that there is the rest of the world. It's not just the affluent countries Absolutely. that are dealing with cancer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And interestingly, it's the lower and middle income countries that are doing the most with AI and medicine right now. So, mm -hmm. for example, I mentioned mm -hmm. the smartphone ultrasound. That's being used not much in the U.S., but if you go to Africa, uh, places in India, and many uh, countries in the developing world, that's where it's being used widely mm -hmm. because they don't have the trained people, and the AI can help them get level the playing field, if you will. So yeah. that's a real interesting paradox. It's great to see that, actually. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Azra, you know, one of the things that people loved from the day before yesterday when we spoke was the poetry you recited. Can I ask you to give us something today to end this session? Always. I claim to know 100,000 verses in memory. <laughs> so um, uh, why don't I end with something that is a message I want to leave all of us with. And this is uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Just a couple of lines from Ulysses. The lights begin to twinkle on the rocks. The long day wanes, the slow moon rises, the deep moan rounds with many voices. Come, my friends, it's not too late to seek a newer world. For my purpose still holds to sail beyond all the bands of stars in the western skies. It may be we shall see the happy isles. It may be we shall see the great Achilles whom we knew. 
and though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that force which in olden days moved heaven and earth, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Mm, wonderful. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> Jamie, before they cut me off, the best thing about this festival always is the range of topics oh, and the variety and diversity of the opinions. And so it's a shameless plug, but I've got a literature talk with Tommy Orange, Joshua Cohn, and, jo and uh, Juno Diaz, and we're going to talk about cultural identity and literature. And so you should go to that, and then you run out of lunch and get a mask and come back because we're going to talk about the pandemic after lunch. Okay? Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming.